Hello again. So what we're looking at today is uh, how an action potential is initiated. So basically we're looking at what happens in receptor cells and how a receptor cell works in order to initiate an action potential. So in terms of receptor cells, in terms of like an overview, um, a receptor cell basically uh, takes a stimulus. So that stimulus is, is some change uh, in the uh, the environment, so it could be a stimulus of light, it could be a stimulus of heat, pressure, um, pH, it could be uh, in the presence of various chemicals, so various ions. Um, and that stimulus then will be detected by the receptor cell and it will cause a receptor potential. So we've looked at action potentials, but uh, which is all to do with depolarization of the membrane. Um, when that depolarization happens in a receptor cell, we call it a receptor potential. So the stimulus causes a receptor potential in the receptor cell. And then that will cause potentially, maybe, um, an action potential in the sensory neuron. It won't always, so just because you have a receptor potential, you may not always get an action potential, but one could lead to the other. Now we know that an action potential is a form of um, electrical energy. Now the stimulus is another kind of energy, so it could be light energy, heat energy, chemical energy. So the stimulus is taking one form of energy and converting it into electrical energy. And something that does that, turns energy from one form to another, is called a transducer. So we can say that a receptor cell is a transducer. Okay, so um, when a receptor cell is stimulated, so there's actually two um, types of receptor. So in this example here, this whole structure here is the sensory neuron. I mean, it would continue down this way, but this is the tip of the sensory neuron. And this very, very tip bit here of the sensory neuron is um, like the receptor area, the receptor zone. Um, but the one which is maybe more common than the one we will look at is where you have a sensory neuron and then a separate receptor cell. Okay, so this whole thing, the sensory neuron, and then here the sensory neuron, then there's a synapse, and then this is a specialised receptor cell. So if we think about um, just the very tip of those receptor cells, or on this one, the, the area um, where the receptor detects the stimulus, and we look at the membrane, so in the normal resting state, you'd have a minus 70 millivolts resting potential. So this is outside of the cell and this is inside the cell. When a stimulus is uh, detected by the receptor cell, it causes depolarization, which means that we have an increase in our potential difference across the membrane. It's still more negative inside compared to outside, okay, so we maybe haven't got, um, it's not an action potential, but there has been depolarization. So when a receptor cell becomes depolarized, um, what we want to think about is how that then links to an action potential. So this graph here, as you can see, we've got strength of stimulus and then the size of the receptor's potential. There, there are no units on there. Um, it's just a, a graph to show the relative, um, like what's happening in relative terms. So obviously when there's no stimulus, the receptor's potential would be zero. But then as you increase the stimulus, the receptor potential increases. So the amount of depolarization increases. Just as when we've talked about action potentials, receptor um, membranes have a threshold level. Now if we look at another graph, and we look here at our um, the, the action potential graph that we're familiar with, um, if I just add onto this, so we've got time along the bottom there. So at the moment, the receptor potential is below the threshold, and the voltage um, in the sensory neuron, okay, 
is at our resting potential. So this is what's happening in our sensory neuron. Okay, that's what this graph is showing. And this graph here is showing what's happening in our receptor cell. Now, if the stimulus strength increases again, that means our receptor potential increases. And now we've hit our threshold. And that means that we see an action potential. So the stimulus has caused enough depolarization in the receptor cell to reach the threshold receptor potential, and that has then triggered an action potential in the sensory neuron. Now, what about if the stimulus gets even stronger? So we've got a stimulus strength here. What if the stimulus strength increases? Well, if that happens, oh, hang on, sorry. Um, okay, so sorry. If the um, if the strength of stimulus increases further, then the receptor potential again has increased. It's above threshold, which means there will be an action potential. But what's important is the size of the action potential hasn't changed. This time we just see more frequent action potentials. So the voltage here, the maximum voltage, is the same when you've got a receptor potential here and when you've got a receptor potential down here at threshold. The size of the action potential is the same. The difference is that we've now got a stronger stimulus and a higher receptor potential, so the frequency of the action potentials is greater. If we increase the stimulus even more, it would just become more frequent. And this is called the all or nothing law. So if we see we've just increased the stimulus strength again, and the action potential is just even more frequent. So all or nothing, that means that if there is, uh, if the receptor potential is high enough to generate an action potential, i.e. if the receptor potential is above the threshold, then an action potential will always be produced and it will be the same size. That's the all part. So either the action potential is at its maximum size, or there is no action potential. There is nothing in between. Um, the receptor potential can't just get bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, the strength of the stimulus um, will not cause any increase in the receptor potential, and that will just plateau. OK, so we want to look now at how the action potential is actually generated. So the example we're going to look at is in the tongue, in the taste buds. So if you imagine this is like a cross-section of the tongue, um, and this is a taste bud. And in the taste bud, there are lots of receptor cells. So I'm just showing you three here. So three separate receptor cells, which are then connected with a synapse to three sensory neurons. And these are chemoreceptors, which means that they are going to detect the presence of different chemicals. Um, and the example we're going to look at is actually sodium receptors, salt receptors. So sodium chloride is that regular table salt. It's in lots of the food we eat. Um, and of course, it will dissociate into sodium and chloride ions. So in this example, these receptor cells here detect the presence of sodium ions um, that are in the food that we eat. So I'm just using these pluses to represent the sodium ions. So these aren't just any old positive charge. These are all sodium ions from the food that we eat. And obviously some of those sodium ions are going to come into contact with the receptor cells here. So if we look at one of those receptor cells there in detail, we've got our sodium ions, and we're going to look at this section of the membrane. And we know that to begin with, so this time I'm just drawing, so, so this is the membrane, so this is outside um, up here and this is inside the receptor cell. So we know that at the moment we're at resting potential, so it's more negative inside than outside the membrane. And the membrane, so it's about minus 70 millivolts, the membrane has lots of um, ion channels in it, so this is a sodium ion channel. Um, so when sodium ions are present in the food that we eat, then those sodium ions are going to move in through 
the membrane, the cell surface membrane to the inside, and that's going to depolarize the membrane. And obviously, if there's enough depolarization, then, you know, as we've looked at before, other voltage gated channels can open. Um, and our depolarization, depending on the size of it, can then cause um, the next stage to take place. So this is our receptor potential, the depolarization of the membrane as a result of the stimulus, which in this case is our sodium ions in the food we eat. Now, further down the membrane, there are um, other channels in the membrane. So we've got calcium channels, and these are gated and they are voltage gated. So this is a calcium channel, and depending on the voltage, this gate will either be closed or open. And what we've also got are these vesicles, which contain um, a neurotransmitter. So what we're about to talk about is basically what happens at all synapses. The depolarization, the receptor potential, causes a change in voltage. Obviously, that's what depolarization is. And that depolarization, that receptor potential, makes the calcium channels open. There's a high concentration of calcium ions outside cells and a low concentration inside. So, of course, calcium is going to diffuse into the receptor cell. When that happens, the presence of calcium inside the cell makes these neurotransmitters, sorry, makes these vesicles move towards the uh, cell surface membrane um, at the base of the receptor cell. And when they get there, they fuse with the membrane and all those neurotransmitter molecules move out by exocytosis. When that happens, that causes an action potential in the sensory neuron. So what we've just seen is how depolarization up here as a result of a stimulus causes a receptor potential. That receptor potential causes calcium ions to move into the membrane further down the receptor cell, which makes vesicles move and release neurotransmitter, and that then triggers an action potential in our sensory neuron. And that's it. Thank you.